It was widely reported that men had been celebrating the attack after recording the first plane strike. They were not Al-Qaeda, but they were detained. I grabbed my binoculars and I could see the towers from my window. And this is where I, you know, I'm looking. And all of a sudden, down there, I see this van park. And I see three guys on top of the van. And I could see that they were like happy. You know, they, 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 were, they didn't look shocked to me. You know, they didn't look shocked. There was a group of Israelis, uh, some of whom later were revealed as Mossad assets, who were arrested after cheering and high-fiving and videotaping uh, the crash of the airplanes into the World Trade Towers. Several other men were detained after a van full of explosives was stopped outside of Manhattan. Earlier we had heard that an FBI spokesperson said that there was a report on the George Washington Bridge, which is another facility which you folks are responsible for policing, uh, a report that there had been a van uh, stopped there that had explosives. Asked this week about another sprawling investigation and the detention of 60 Israelis since September 11th, the Bush administration treated the questions like hot potatoes. I would just refer you to the Department of Justice with it. I'm not familiar with the report. I'm aware that uh, some Israeli citizens have been detained. With respect to why they are being retained, detained and the other aspects of, of your question, whether it's because they are in intelligence services or what they were doing, I will uh, defer to the Department of Justice and the FBI to answer that. On March 6, 2002, a draft report from the DEA said it, may well be an organized intelligence gathering activity. Despite all of this, all the Israelis were let go without any espionage charges being filed. Fox News anchors Brit Hume and Carl Cameron would do a four-part investigation into these allegations in December of 2001 and yield stunning results. It has been more than 16 years since a civilian working for the Navy was charged with passing secrets to Israel. Jonathan Pollard pled guilty to conspiracy to commit espionage and is serving a life sentence. At first, Israeli leaders claimed Pollard was part of a rogue operation, but later took responsibility for his work. Now Fox News has learned some U.S. investigators believe that there are Israelis again very much engaged in spying in and on the U.S. Since September 11th, more than 60 Israelis have been arrested or detained, either under the new Patriot anti-terrorism law or for immigration violations. A handful of active Israeli military were among those detained, according to investigators, who say some of the detainees also failed polygraph questions when asked about alleged surveillance activities against and in the United States. Investigators suspect that the Israelis may have gathered intelligence about the attacks in advance and not shared it. A highly placed investigator said there are, quote, tie-ins. But when asked for details, he flatly refused to describe them, saying, quote, evidence linking these Israelis to 911 is classified. I cannot tell you about evidence that has been gathered. It's classified information. Now, when the FBI investigated, uh, it quickly unraveled to be the largest foreign spy ring ever uncovered inside the United States, the largest. Even the Soviet Union had not been spying on the United States as much as Israel has been doing. So they, the FBI started to round up these spies. They started to arrest them very quietly. And they were about halfway through this process of rounding up this spy ring when 9-11 happened. Numerous classified documents obtained by Fox News indicate that even prior to September 11th, as many as 140 other Israelis had been detained or arrested in a secretive and sprawling investigation into suspected espionage by Israelis in the United States. Investigators from numerous government agencies are part of a working group that's been compiling evidence since the mid-90s. These documents detail hundreds of incidents in cities and towns across the country that investigators say, quote, may well be an organized intelligence gathering activity. The first part of the investigation focuses on Israelis who say they are art students from the University of Jerusalem and Bazalel Academy. Documents say they, quote, targeted and penetrated military bases, the DEA, FBI, and dozens of other government facilities, and even secret offices and unlisted private homes of law enforcement and intelligence personnel. The majority of those questioned, quote, stated they served in military intelligence, electronic surveillance intercept, and or explosive ordnance units. Why would Israelis spy in and on the U.S.? A general accounting office investigation referred to Israel as country A and said, quote, according to a U.S. intelligence agency, 
the government of country A conducts the most aggressive espionage operation against the U.S. of any U.S. ally. The document concludes, quote, Israel possesses the resources and technical capability to achieve its collection objectives. What about this question of advanced knowledge of what was going to happen on 9-11? How clear are investigators that some Israeli agents may have known something? Well, it's very explosive information, obviously, and there's a great deal of evidence that they say they have collected. None of it necessarily conclusive. It's more when they put it all together. A bigger question, they say, is how could they not have known? Almost a direct quote, Brett. It is now apparent that this intelligence ring was inside the U.S., had prior knowledge of 9-11, and had a classified role in 9-11, which officials refused to discuss. It was also able to penetrate U.S. intelligence agencies and secret offices, yet all were released. The men who were detained due to the report they were taping the first plane crash and then celebrating and joking about it actually went on television and admitted it was their job to record the attack. And at that point, we were taken for another round of questioning, this time related to our allegedly being members of Mossad. The fact of the matter is, we are coming from a country that experiences terror daily. Our purpose was to document the event. How could they have known about the attack? And who sent them to document it? The evidence points to a large intelligence network inside the United States that had teams on the ground, such as the ones recording the attack, and electronic surveillance teams gathering information. Another team who was involved that day detonated explosives on the ground. Yeah, both suspects under K. We have the suspects who drove the van that had exploded. Yeah, I just want to make sure you and your guys are all right over there, K. That's all. You know, we have both field trans driven that exploded. One location, two between six and seven. The shooting is on the scene on team six or seven. What you need on? How would these teams obtain their information? The investigation on our side basically tracked back to two companies. The first one was called Amdocs. This is an Israeli-owned company which does the billing for 90% of the telephone companies inside the United States. Fox News has learned that some American terrorism investigators fear certain suspects in the September 11th attacks may have managed to stay ahead of them by knowing who and when investigators are calling on the telephone. How? By obtaining and analyzing data that's generated every time someone in the U.S. makes a phone call. One sitting in state, please. Here's how the system works. Most directory assistance calls and virtually all call records and billing in the U.S. are done for the phone companies by Amdocs Limited, an Israeli-based private telecommunications company. Amdocs has contracts with the 25 biggest phone companies in America and more worldwide. It is virtually impossible to make a call on normal phones without generating an Amdocs record of it. In recent years, the FBI and other government agencies have investigated Amdocs more than once. Sources tell Fox News that in 1999, the super-secret National Security Agency, headquartered in Northern Maryland, issued what's called a top-secret, sensitive, compartmentalized information report, TSSCI, warning that records of calls in the United States we're getting into foreign hands, in Israel in particular. Fox News has learned that the NSA has held numerous classified conferences to warn the FBI and CIA how Amdocs records could be used. So if you know the name of a police officer, or even if you know the name just of an informant, you can follow that network of who is talking to who and basically determine that whole association of names and contacts that uh, uh, represent that unit of, of operation. Fox News has documents of a 1997 drug trafficking case in Los Angeles in which telephone information, the types that Amdocs collects, was used to, quote, completely compromise the communications of the FBI, the Secret Service, the DEA, and the LAPD. Amdocs would not be the only company with ties to the Israeli government. Israel was also gathering information from a separate business, Converse Infosys, who was also listening in. This company inside the United States installs and maintains the phone tapping equipment that law enforcement and the government use to eavesdrop on your phone calls. The company is Converse Infosys, a subsidiary of an Israeli-run private telecommunications firm with offices throughout the U.S. It provides wiretapping equipment for law enforcement. 
Here's how wiretapping works in the U.S. Every time you make a call, it passes through the nation's elaborate network of switchers and routers run by the phone companies. Custom computers and software made by companies like Converse are tied into that network to intercept, record, and store the wiretapped calls and at the same time transmit them to investigators. We know we just had this uh, uh, FISA bill go through that granted uh, immunity to the telecom companies. It was Converse Infosystem that was setting up all these special rooms and all the switching centers where the law enforcement or the government or whoever could simply push a button and listen to your phone call. Gone are the days of the little alligator clips and wires uh, needed to eavesdrop on a phone call. They can sit in a room anywhere in America, touch a few buttons, and listen to your phone call.